Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the final panel of this year's Nuremberg Forum. After the previous panel showed us the importance of highlighting the delicate but significant interaction between accountability initiatives, transitional justice mechanisms, and preventive uh, initiatives, we are now going to the final panel, which will be moderated by Dr. Angar Verma. Dr. Verma is also a senior officer at the Nuremberg Academy and is a lawyer specialized in international criminal law and peace and conflict studies. Angar will now introduce us to his distinguished panelists and the focus of his panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kiran. Um, a very, very warm welcome, everyone, be it online or on site, uh, to the fifth and final panel of this year's Nuremberg Forum on the Protection of Children in Armed Conflict. The panel is titled Ways Forward, Protecting Future Generation. This implies a widely accepted position that, which has also been expressed over the past few days that children, that on a factual and human level, there is not, children in armed conflict are not sufficiently protected. There is a sense of urgency. There is a need for action. Regarding the legal and policy, political level, things appear to be a, a bit more foggy regarding what is to be done. It seems less clear if and how the world of international law and politics should actually react. Some argue that the existing legal framework and the, uh, the, the existing legal framework is already sufficient, whereas the main problems lie on the enforcement or ratification level. Others argue or propose new legal instruments, new amendments to existing laws, or the extension of mandates on UN level. So while there is a consensus that we want to move forward, it is less clear which way is to be taken. Therefore, the panel poses the following overarching uh, question, that is, does the legal and institutional framework for the protection of children in armed conflict need to be improved, and if so, how? In less, less words, what remains to be done by whom? Given the complexity of the issue and time and format constraints, the panel obviously cannot provide a, the comprehensive uh, solution to, to this, to, for this question, but we will try to, what the panel rather tries to do is discuss and explore various ideas uh, in the larger puzzle in the pursuit of claiming children as zones of peace, to quote Garza Margel. It is my genuine pleasure to explore these questions um, with such an impressive panel of experts. Allow me to introduce the panel and invite each member to deliver an opening statement. I will start with Professor Diane Marie Amen. Professor Amen is currently a research visitor at, at Oxford and a fellow at the Exeter College. She is usually the, the Regents Professor of International Law at the University of Georgia. From 2012 until 2021, she served as Special Advisor on Children in and Affected by Armed Conflict for the then ICC Prosecutor Fatou Bonsouda. Professor Eamon, may I ask you kindly for your opening statement? Yes, thank you so much, Angar, and my deep thanks to all at the Academy for the honor of speaking at this forum. Just yesterday, we learned that Nihon Hidankyo, a group of survivors of the atomic bombings that occurred in 1945, has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for this year. In the Washington Post, one of the co-heads of that organization, Toshiyuki Mimaki, was quoted um, for what the Post noted was the attention that he drew to war children today. And I quote, the world, he said, is in a different situation right now. There were a lot of children who grew up as orphans after the atomic bombings, and right now, children in Gaza are suffering." Unquote. I bring this up for two reasons. One is it's a remarkable bearing of witness by one war child in empathy with the war children of today. And of course, we could add to his list Ukraine, um, I have the honor of serving on the Bring Back Kids UA Task Force by appointment of the Presidency of Ukraine. We could add Israel itself, Yemen, Sudan, Myanmar, and indeed all five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, Russia, China, 
France, the United Kingdom, and the United States. We need to acknowledge, and this is my second reason, that during the Nuremberg era, not in this building nor any other building, was there ever a full reckoning either for the United States bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nor of the Allied carpet bombing, which occurred not only in cities like Berlin and Tokyo, but indeed which leveled this city as well. As a child and human rights expert who has citizenship in Ireland and the United States, I am drawn again and again to working to uncover the histories and work for full reckonings in those countries and especially in the country of my birth. And so a focus of my remarks today will be the histories and reckoning going forward for the criminal phenomenon that I call child taking as it occurred against hundreds of thousands of indigenous children forced into assimilationist residential schools in North America as early as the 1790s until, and until after the Convention on the Rights of the Child entered into force. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Amen. Um, I would like to continue with Ms. Christine Hausler. Ms. Hausler is the director of the Center for International Law at the British Institute for International and Comparative Law, where she has developed and led several research projects on human rights, international humanitarian law, and international criminal law, with a specific focus on matters of cultural heritage and education in the context of armed conflict. Ms. Hausler, may I ask you, also ask you for your opening statement? Yes, yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to be here for the, for the first time and very impressed um, by what I have witnessed uh, so far. I think it's been a really in interesting, insightful uh, conference, but also uh, really emotional. So I really uh, appreciated all the sharing of all the stories. I've really, really learned a lot. I understand that I think I've been invited mostly to discuss perhaps some of my past work regarding to education, but I'll take the opportunity uh, of this opening statement to say something about uh, heritage and cultural heritage where I do uh, most of my work because we're talking about uh, the future of future generation and of course in the term heritage in itself it is something that we inherit from a past generation and something that we want to pass on to the next generation and uh, just as a, as a small anecdote to, uh, to mention how relevant uh, this is also to children I did conduct uh, quite some training uh, for uh, armed forces including uh, non-state armed groups and uh, once uh, I did a pilot uh, training and that was part of a larger IHL uh, training session and I was the very last to arrive and it was a pilot the first time they were doing this training on cultural heritage. So I was a little bit hesitant as to how interested uh, the participant would be in a session on cultural heritage. So I started by asking them, does it matter to you? Do you care about heritage in your territory? Is that really something you're interested in knowing more about? You know, how the law protects heritage? And what they responded to me right away is this is extremely important because we want to have something to pass down to our children. So here I think the link uh, is uh, really uh, clear and obvious and I think could be perhaps uh, um, looked at um, a little bit um, more because heritage side of course have a role to play in education in how we address the past in transitional justice. We had that wonderful uh, presentation at the very beginning with this uh, museum in Sarajevo of world childhood. Um, I have just seen as well that in Timbuktu they have uh, officially um, um, presented the collective uh, measures uh, that included um, measures regarding uh, heritage, so of course uh, the, or the mausoleum, the mosque, the, those have been rebuilt, um, but they have also uh, opened a new room in the local museum, so they have really included that. And that, of course, appears something perhaps quite obvious because they were looking at attacks on, on cultural heritage, but I think perhaps that should be included as well and considered a little bit more in also the reparations order regarding other uh, violations, including those uh, regarding our children. So perhaps to consider uh, the role of this museum, of this memorial site, uh, Professor the grief, you mentioned, of course, the importance of memorialization. So I think perhaps uh, to consider the possibility of including cultural heritage, not just sites, 
but also objects. And I'll just end with uh, another small anecdote. I used to work with uh, First Nations in Canada, and uh, I was discussing with some nations there uh, who had actually all been through the residential school system and had suffered of a loss of culture, of loss of their language, and were discussing the importance of, for them of the return of cultural objects. And again, I was like uh, asking them, is that something that you care, is it a priority or not? And somebody was telling me, yes, for education purposes, right? We like to teach, uh, it's important to teach with the objects, to teach with the sites, because of course you get a completely different understanding um, of your, your own identity and perhaps of, of what happened uh, also in the past. Thank you very much, Ms. Hausler. And we are also delighted, of course, delighted to have uh, Betty Kari Murungi on this panel. Uh, Betty Murungi is currently a professor of practice at the Center for Gender Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Among her many, many distinguished roles, she has served as a member of the Independent Commission of Inquiry for, for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, appointed by the UN Human Rights Council. Additionally, she is a member of the Academy's Advisory Council. Betty, a very, very warm welcome to you as well, and may I also kindly ask you for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Anga. Um, I'm really delighted to be on this graveyard uh, panel, the last panel of the forum. Uh, and this is because uh, we all sort of have a sense of uh, the subject that we're discussing. One of the highlights of my year is coming to this forum and, and sitting and listening to experts and to practitioners. Uh, but I always enjoy the perspectives that come from the practitioners um, at these forums. Uh, many of us here have been engaged in the world of international humanitarian law, international um, criminal justice, and so we have really the laws and the practices at our fingertips. What I've heard over the last uh, couple of days is that uh, we have been updating our laws and our frameworks for protection of children in armed conflict. Uh, the reports obviously um, are very um, sobering. Um, for me, coming from Africa and coming from the African continent, it is a matter of uh, grave concern that, in fact, Sudan now is the site of the largest child displacement crisis in the world. Um, we don't hear very much about the 14 million children that are in dire need of humanitarian support or the 4 million children that are starving. Uh, they are severely malnourished. Uh, and yet, of course, we continue to speak about um, uh, responses, uh, humanitarian responses, and so on. I've also uh, worked um, considerably uh, over the past uh, 10 years in situations of, uh, of, of armed conflict and in post-conflict uh, countries, uh, and have witnessed uh, at very close quarters uh, the completion of peace agreements uh, that um, elaborate all these protection measures that we've been speaking about over the last uh, uh, couple of days. So I'm really looking forward to a conversation uh, on this panel that speaks to how we are framing the issues of protection. Uh, you know, from what I've been hearing, we've been framing them from, um, you know, children as, uh, as, as victims, as vulnerable uh, populations. And this panel, I think, is going to unpack for us how um, children can also be considered as agents uh, uh, of, um, of change, as, as participants in all of these conversations uh, that we're having. Of course, it's not lost on me that we don't have any children here. We should perhaps have invited children, uh, and that's on us. I mean, I'm on the uh, advisory board of the Nuremberg uh, Academy, um, and so this is something that I think we can also think about, that uh, we are speaking about children uh, being participants and contributing to, um, you know, uh, suggesting how they should be protected and so on across 
uh, the continuum of violence, which is another issue that I think came up yesterday in the conversation um, in, in the panels, which is another issue I'm hoping that we'll be able to, uh, to dig into. So thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. Last, but very definitely not least, we are honored to have Ms. Laila Sirugi on the panel. Ms. Sirugi served from 2012 until 2017 as Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict at the Under Secretary General level. Prior to this, she was the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General and Deputy Head of the United Nations Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ms. Sirugi, it is our pleasure to welcome you, and we are eager to he also hear your opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, uh, Nuremberg uh, uh, Academy for giving me this opportunity. It's the first time, and I really appreciate uh, it was an opportunity to hear from many people from different perspectives uh, uh, because we are in a context that everyone is saying it's difficult time, what will happen after, uh, uh, and every time we, we, we are confronted to this, every time. I, start, I was born during our liberation war. I was deprived of my father that I did not so until, see until the independence. Then I started working as juvenile judge. And then the 19, uh, 2000 difficult uh, uh, 10 years in Algeria with, with the terrorism. And then when I started in Geneva, I started with 9-11. And you can imagine you are in charge of uh, arbitrary detention, and this happened, and Guantanamo Bay created, etc. And every time we think it's a disaster. When I went to Congo in 2008, I was appointed for the first time a DSRG rule of law to strengthen the rule of law, but in, because the, in the mind of the Secretary General at the time that we are leaving Congo. The election took place in 2006, so 2008 is fine. We are preparing for leaving. I arrive less than a month, 25 days, and we have the CNDP attack on Kiwanja, massacre, everything, and I started uh, with something else that I have to, uh, and of course, the children, women, mass rape, etc. and it was, I thought, it's a disaster. Why I'm mentioning all this is to say, when I become the SRG uh, for uh, uh, children armed conflict, 2012, the war in the Middle East, all what's happened in Syria, all what happened in Yemen, in all this was at the beginning. So every time uh, I think it's a, uh, I came in the wrong time. But I think that sometimes this very complex situation opened doors also. And we have to think while we are seeing all the difficulties to advance and improve uh, the protection of children, we have also to ask ourselves, in this context, how I can move in a, in a way that will, by step, help things to move in the right direction. And in my opinion, the most important, of course, we hear about all the complexity that we know with, with, with regard to the definition of a child, 15, 18, uh, when they, they are, the government are allowed to, to, uh, to involve them in armed conflict or not. We speak about uh, the uh, accountability, the protection of a child that testify, all these things. But I believe that in many conflict settings, these issues are not even discussed because people don't have even the birth registration. And you have to identify the child through mechanism that I put in place when I arrived to Congo. The birth, the, the birth not the birth registration, but the uh, uh, age verification mechanism. The entrance in the army at the, when they get out. So you have to stop no, me. No, no, yeah? no, no. So we have, no, it's true, it's true, you are allowed. Okay, so, no, otherwise I don't want, so that's just to explain. So I have never mentioned the 15 years 
I only speak about 80. They ratified the convention, so I speak about 80. And never raise this issue in, in many settings where people are not even thinking about this. They are more not knowing how to identify a child when you are 16, 17, 18. So we said we will help you by creating an age verification that help you to screen your troops, ensure nobody is there, and then when you have an exam to integrate, to recruit, we do the same for those who succeed in the exam. And then when you arrest uh, armed groups, we do the screening. That was with UNICEF, with other. And how, uh, I mean, we, we have to identify how we can advance process on the ground. The first time uh, I have to discuss the 15 years was when I was mediating between the FARC and the government. So that's, I, I, I just say, how we can see uh, processes and opportunities. I can discuss later, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, but, but I mean, you are speaking, speaking of the very important doors that we want to find, the open doors, yeah. right? And to get a bit more technical still, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, starting with the first question in that regard, uh, I would like to turn to you, Professor Eamon. Um, Focusing on the legal framework first, um, in 2018, a book was published under the leadership of Shahid Fatima titled Protecting Children in Armed Conflict. Not only were you a member of the uh, inquiry's advisory panel of this book, but you also engaged somewhat critically, I would also say, with some of its proposals. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts on one of the key proposals made. Uh, the authors advocated for a new comprehensive treaty to protect children in armed conflicts. So my question to you is, do you see this as a viable way forward? Do you see this as a door that we should walk through? Or, or put differently, should we remain committed to the current legal fr framework while amending it at most? Or should we rather push for a lex verenda in the form of a new single comprehensive treaty? Thank you. I think. Uh, I begin by responding that I often feel a little bit of anarchy is a good thing, by which I mean I am skeptical of any effort to be comprehensive and all-encompassing in response to events that are dynamic, ever-changing, um, ever-mutating, not unlike the COVID virus, to elude regulation and suppression. And so, Beyond that, to adopt anything like a comprehensive new treaty is an incredible resource diversion. Um, and one wonders if the energy that that requires isn't better spent on trying to make existing frameworks work better and to push the envelopes of those frameworks. And so I guess I'm a Lex Verenda girl. Um, and I think that means both interpreting words in existing documents in a creative, open, uh, teleological, purpose-based, and contemporary way. One of the examples that I would use is, is something that has remarkably, to me, not been mentioned yet, the question of whether children who either identify or identify are identified as being somewhere on the LGBTQ plus spectrum are protected by existing documents. A few years ago, when Ireland passed a referendum allowing same-sex marriage and the United States Supreme Court uh, handed down the Obergefell decision and lots of other developments in that range were happening elsewhere, I would have thought the answer was obviously yes. But we're in a moment where there's now a question. And so maybe that's a place where we can't simply rely on what we common lawyers, law lawyers, would talk about the development of the law. But we do need to say in writing that queer kids are protected. Because I kind of think that they're less protected now than they were a few years ago. But beyond that, I think, again, we should think about resource allocation 
and maybe make the best of treaties that exist. We also haven't talked about the In Development Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, which sits in the Sixth Committee of the United Nations at the moment. There is some movement to try to strengthen the discussion of children, which at the moment is none in that treaty. Uh, it's very difficult to do because you have the question of, do you just add child every, in every article? Do you have some sort of manifesto in the preamble? How do you do it? But that would be a place to do it. And since I've um, spoken critically of the United States, I should say that we should welcome the announcement by Ambassador Beth von Skock last week that the United States had joined 70 other countries in seeking the onset of negotiations of that treaty. So questions about children and other issues may be addressed in that process. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this also leads me to the next question that I would like to address to you, uh, Ms. Hausler, because in a similar yet more specific vein, um, focusing on your expertise uh, on, on education in the context uh, of armed conflict, what is your view regarding the current legal framework? Um, are there, for instance, gaps in the legal protection of education or education-related uh, objects and persons um, during armed conflict that you think are to be filled, and if yes, how? Yeah, thank you uh, very much for the question. I think there's been uh, quite a lot of discussion already on the, on the legal gaps, and uh, many of which, of course, uh, I agree with. Perhaps uh, I'll, I'll build on what um, was just said about perhaps working with what we, what we have. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I see a lot of, uh, of gaps in the implementation, uh, but also in the understanding uh, of the provisions that we have, and perhaps also to uh, better look at the different uh, provisions and the different legal uh, frameworks uh, all together. Um, so that's um, perhaps uh, something I, I want to um, talk about a little bit. I want to perhaps also just react to a few things that have already been said. Uh, one uh, regards uh, access to justice, and I think here there is quite a clear gap. That yesterday, um, Professor Trumbull, I think that was you, um, who asked the question whether we are really ready to listen to children. And I think that if you look at the ratification of the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, when it's only a quarter uh, of, uh, of state parties about that have, uh, that have uh, ratified it a little bit more, uh, I think the answer is in a way quite clear that maybe we're not quite ready uh, to, to listen to children. I'm of course not uh, talking about people in the room, but, uh, but, but more widely. Uh, so I think that's, uh, this level of ratification I think is important to perhaps keep in mind. And of course it was mentioned uh, so well yesterday by, uh, by uh, Professor Skelton that uh, children have all human rights. They have access to, of course, uh, other committees and can make individual complaints to, to other committees. But I think this is just quite a, quite a signal there. Uh, the other perhaps point I just want to add, uh, because of everything that's been said regarding access to justice, is I was quite struck when we're discussing quite a bit about how children fit or don't fit the um, the the procedures that exist. And uh, there was an interesting point that was made yesterday about uh, looking also at the domestic level. Uh, and I know that this has been discussed, but I just wanted to raise it about uh, the possibility also of looking at at um, changing perhaps the seat of the court, uh, especially uh, with, with the ICC. Um, I know that this is very difficult and that there are resources issues, there are security issues, but I think that um, when you consider perhaps uh, including children as witness, that could be you know, another good case to perhaps uh, uh, move that seat. And the reason I'm mentioning domestic courts is because, again, I, I want to go back to the, the context where I work in the past in British Columbia in Canada. And there was a case at the, the BC Supreme Court there where they had to hear stories from elders. Actually, it wasn't children, it was elders. But they lived uh, in a valley quite far away from the seat of the, the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court decided for two weeks to actually move the seat. And it was, I think, in the middle of winter. There was snow. It was very complicated. But they did it. Uh, and they went there to, to listen to those stories and I think some of them even had to be listened after dark because there were stories that could only be told after dark but they were very important uh, for the, the core of the case that had to prove title to their land so that was uh, really important and that's something that was to be, to be done so it was just uh, something I wanted to, to just uh, mention although I, I understand the practical difficulties. Um, the other, perhaps, in terms of implementation is to ensure also the, the understanding 
of the legal frameworks, uh, the legal provisions that, that we have. Um, and again, I'll, I'll go back to you with your, your great example and your poem about this house that can be both protective and, mm -hmm. uh, and also a, a source of violence. And it's very much the same as schools, right? You're asking me to talk about education, but because I've worked directly with people who have been through residential schools, you can see that they can be really uh, places uh, of, of violence and of, uh, of human rights uh, um, violation. So I think it's really important to consider, you know, what kind of education we're protecting. And if we look, for example, at IHL, it's well the protection of school as buildings, and there's very little as to what is happening uh, inside the school, at least when there is perhaps training going on. And I was quite struck as well with the mention of indoctrinations. We talked about Russia and Professor Skelton. Again, you mentioned uh, Russia coming, uh, you know, before your committee and. and being very clear that for them they think it's it's very good to talk about these war heroes, etc. So here um, I um, perhaps wonder if there is a little bit more work or awareness raising, I don't know if it's a general comment or, or a special rapporteur's annual report, perhaps on the question of indoctrination that could be perhaps be raised um, a little bit more at the, uh, at the international level. Um, with that, I would also just like to point to the ICJ decision of January 2024 when um, they did not uh, admit a lot of the alleged violation that um, Ukraine had um, alleged against Russia with regard to Crimea, especially with regard to an um, allegation of racial discrimination. But they did admit a violation of racial discrimination with regard to schools and education when curriculums have been changed and when the language of education has been changed. So again, here I think uh, language is something that is uh, really uh, also important to keep in mind. So I know, for example, in the ICC policy, that talks about um, you know, evidence of, um, of perhaps violation that regard education and to look at school attendance. But of course, it's much more than that. It's regarding also the type of education that the people are receiving, not the number of people uh, going to, uh, to the school. So um, that's one point I wanted to make. And the last one uh, regards reparation. Um, I wanted to go back to the ongoing case. It's been mentioned already, uh, of course, a couple of times. Uh, I want to salute first the, uh, the affirmation of transgeneration uh, trauma uh, in that reparation order, which uh, I think was, was quite clear and really interesting. I really appreciated uh, Dr. Daniele's uh, contribution to that, and especially regarding Holocaust survivors. And again, with regard to First Nations and the trauma, the intergenerational trauma that they have suffered, and the provisions that now need to be put in place that perhaps have not been put in place and to look at the result of not putting in place certain measures and the disenfranchisement that it leads to certain groups uh, and the self-destructive behavior and those kinds of patterns. I think there's also a lot to learn from uh, this, uh, this context. Um, the only perhaps uh, uh, caveat I want to point with regard to, to the ongoing uh, reparations, of course, um, a lot of people are concerned with uh, the, the amount of reparations and the, the practicality uh, of that, but of course it's also something that uh, many are welcome um, because it's gone um, really uh, quite, uh, quite far. Um, but I think the, uh, the only issue, I mean, I guess the point that I really appreciated in that reparations order at the very beginning was the fact that they recognized that there were victims beyond the victims that were recognized uh, in that order. And I think that's really, really an, an important factor. Uh, and with regard to that, what I just hope, and because we're still, I guess, uh, a bit in the beginning of this uh, implementation, it's still quite a new area of this implementation of the ICC reparations in the ground, is to make sure that they are integrated also with other transitional measures and that they are articulated with transitional measures. So it's a sort of holistic approach because otherwise I think it's important for the court to understand that this is not the end of the process, even if it's the end of the process at the ICC, right? That on the ground it's really the beginning of a process and you don't want to lead to a situation where you may perhaps disenfranchise other groups because they will feel uh, left out from a reparations order. So I think uh, this is perhaps something to also work on a bit more. Thank you very much, Ms. Hausler, for these very interesting different angles. And I would like to add one more perspective together with you, uh, Betty. Um, I would like to focus on our imagination of children to be protected. Um, 
Prosecutor Khan two days ago emphasized our collective responsibility to view all children, regardless of their color, nationality, religion, or culture, as equal and as children of the world. How far away are we um, from f fulfilling such call for, let's say, a universal ethos of uh, protecting children in armed conflict, uh, and or are there maybe, let's say, for instance, racial biases um, that influence our commitment to the protecting uh, of children in armed conflict, especially also in our roles as lawyers or policy makers? Well, I mean, the simple answer to your question is that we are very far away. Uh, but having said that, I think the pernicious uh, racism, for example, in media coverage um, of, of wars that are currently raging, um, you know, in Ukraine, in Sudan, in Gaza, in, you know, all of these places, all the 13 sort of wars that are currently ongoing. I mean, that is to be expected. So I, I was not as angry as <laughs> many other colleagues uh, when at the onset of uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, you know, there was coverage about an outrage, a lot of outrage expressed across the globe about, you know, people who look like us, uh, you know, uh, suffering and all of this. Uh, there was a famous, I think, Al Jazeera uh, journalist who was roundly uh, condemned. So, so that, I think, was to be expected. What is not to be expected is continued silence. You know, the silence around the, for example, let us just take the 15,000 plus children that have died, have been killed in the war in Gaza. I mean, the silence around that is completely inexcusable. And this is not to say that um, Hamas did not commit offenses. They committed offenses, they abducted children, they kidnapped children, they killed children. That is all very well, but the attention, the media attention particularly, is, is, is what is disturbing. The media silence on the suffering of children in Sudan is, is, uh, is, is upsetting. The humanitarian responses um, is another issue. Uh, member states contribute to these funds that are, are set up for the different uh, humanitarian situations and um, regional uh, blocks contribute to those funds. So if the European Union contributes more money to respond to the victims in their, uh, in their region, uh, we in, in other parts of the world need to be doing the same. Germany is the host of the largest number of refugees, if I'm not wrong. But if you look at the nationalities of the refugees that are admitted, including children, you'll find they're from Turkey, they're from Lebanon, they're from Yemen and Syria, not from, say, Africa, for example. But we in Africa also have a country towards the tip of the south that doesn't want refugees uh, from other parts of Africa. So, so we, we, we can't really be pointing the finger that saying, um, you know, that they don't want us in Europe and therefore they don't want, you know, ex-refugees in their country, when we ourselves uh, are probably not uh, being as open to receiving the refugees. Having said that, the number of refugees, for example, from Sudan, who include these four million children that I've spoken about, are being hosted in countries which themselves are in post-conflict reconstruction. So what does that say about um, uh, the strategies of protection that we've all been talking about? 19 million children from Sudan are out of school and they are being given refuge across the border in South Sudan, which is itself coming out of conflict, which itself does not have educational institutions, which itself does not have the necessary health facilities, which is part of all the protection we were talking about. Um, so these are, these are important questions, I think, as uh, humanitarian um, actors and as uh, international 
uh, human rights actors and as international organizations uh, need to look into in terms of responses um, uh, to, to, to the protection uh, frameworks that we are putting in place. Uh, finally, on, on this particular question that you've asked, is an understanding of the nuanced kind of experiences of children uh, affected by armed conflict. Many of these children, uh, and I'm speaking here in, in, in contexts that I'm familiar with, South Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia, and other places, are themselves acting as adults. We have children-headed households. Those children are really not the child that you, many of us conceive. They have taken on the responsibility of adults because they do not themselves have parents. They, their parents don't exist. They, they were killed. And so therefore, when you're thinking about the protection lens, um, which I think is important, how are we treating this child who is themselves responsible for children, for younger siblings uh, uh, in their custody? So these then become um, you know, important aspects for us to, uh, to consider. Um, the framework of protection uh, policies that have been introduced recently by the African Union um, frame children as, you know, victims, passive uh, victims of, uh, of protection. And I think uh, that itself uh, creates uh, quite a, a difficulty in terms of um, um, you know, having proper measures for relief and recovery where they exist, um, and for the other measures that we have mentioned, the health, the education, uh, and so on, and the other domains of protection uh, that uh, is envisaged by these laws. Thank you very much, Betty. Mr. Rugi, um, during the opening statement, Mr. Yasminko Halilovic, who is still present with us, uh, thankfully, um, urged us to ask those in political power the question, why are we not doing enough? Um, building on this point and considering your extensive experience working with states and their policymakers in the realm of children and armed conflict, I would like to ask, where do you see potential for mobilizing the very essential political will um, among states, but also among armed groups uh, when it comes, for instance, um, to the implementation of policies that you also touched upon in your opening statement? I think uh, uh, when we speak about implementing, it doesn't mean that uh, because we need at the international level the legitimacy to speak about, for example, the, uh, the uh, um, child uh, CRC uh, uh, finding and uh, the way they are trying to uh, uh, give uh, uh, positive and uh, well-advanced interpretation even in, if you have, <coughs> and we have to support that. Same with regard to the uh, mandate that I used to, to be in, and now uh, uh, Virginia is, is uh, leading, uh, we need this. There is no doubt about it. But we need also to have the entry point in the field, in country. Of course, when you are working on this issue, you know who, where you have the space and how you can build the trust because without trust, and I repeat again, in this context, for example, in Africa, and she mentioned all the ten, why people are unhappy with the international system, because they consider there is no attention to that. So it's important that we understand that we have to convince people on the ground that it's in their best interest. We are not telling them just to follow the international norms. We are telling them, I used to say when I go to meet with leaders, to say, look, a colonial power come to you, can kill children, can do whatever. They return home, you stay with the disaster. But you are dealing with your own people. It's like someone has a, a virus in his body, 
either you manage to get it out without harming yourself or you end up disabled or killed. So it's, that's the language that you have to discuss with uh, uh, leaders on the ground that you have, you are the one. I always say I will never be able to do anything without you on board because you are the master, you are the one in your country, you are the one who can decide. I'm here to support. I'm here to provide maybe technical support, logistical support, guidance, but you are the one. And I insist on this, when we, because people now don't accept that you come and lecture them. We have to understand that, even, the, even the, in the bush. And you know that I am working now on the Sahel. I am on the high-level panel on the Sahel, and we, are, we met with all presidents in, in this part of the world, with all what is going on there, but people are not accepting that you lecture them. So that's why, uh, first of all, the methodology. Second, finding the way to interest people in what you are trying to sell them. And third, is also to deliver, because if you just come and lecture and speak about a human right and what is, people will not listen to you. That's why, for example, when I pushed, when I was in DRC, to create the criminal chain. Why I did it, the mobile criminal chain, is first to help a government that don't have the resources and the capacity, and also don't have justice everywhere, and help, you can do it, and you will be the one that will handle your people accountable, and we will be providing the support. So that's, for me, extremely important that I, I will not be complicit, but I'm not here to lecture. I'm here to assist and to try to help. And I will speak out once I always say, I don't want to be an NGO writing a report and complaining. I am the UN, you are part of it. And you, uh, uh, you will, uh, uh, I'm here to help. And if you push me, put me in a corner that I have nothing but to blame you, then I will do it. But if I can speak about what is happening and say that's what you did. And for example, when I remember two things. When I arrived in DRC, and Radhika Kumaraswamy came for the first visit in DRC. We were uh, received by uh, uh, the military, and they have three children in, in the... And I was fighting with them to get the children out. And they were angry because they considered these are their military. What, what, what I am saying? And when I returned in 2013 as SRG, I will just read what the same commander forgetting about this story told me. I came to sign the, uh, uh, the action plan. He said, SRG, we have changed how we look at children. We don't recruit them anymore. It's in our blood. The change is irreversible, an army general told me. So that's something that I was so happy because he forget the fight I have with him five years ago. And, uh, uh, and it is true because we released them from the list of shame. They were uh, removed because they stopped recruiting children. But how, they, how we did that? Because we put the age verification, the, we criminalized the recruitment, but they are the one doing it, it's not us. And the most important, and we'll stop with this, it's also to let them understand that they have so many children beyond 18. Be, though, uh, so many young people beyond, that are 19, 20, without a job, will be happy to join the army. Why you are pushing to have uh, a less than 18? And this, all this kind of discussion helped to move on this. And I, I, uh, 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 I would uh, emphasize uh, on this. It's very important that we convince people. Of course, you will not always succeed, but you have to try. 
Thank you very much. That was indeed very insightful. And talking about convincing concepts, uh, uh, Professor Eamon, if I may return to you, you wrote a very interesting piece that you already touched upon uh, in which you conceptualize the phenomenon of child taking. Uh, I think it can help shed lies on the ways forward regarding the protection of children in armed conflict. Uh, and my question regarding this concept are, first of all, very basic. What is child taking? And sitting in this courtroom, what's Nuremberg got to do with it? And the follow-up question would be, what added value does the con this concept offer for the legal, legal or institutional protection of children in armed conflict? Thank you, Angar. I'd be happy to answer those, but I, I first have to um, just underscore the inspiration that Leila Zarugi is. Um, she was the SRSG when um, I was asked by Fatou Ben Souda to begin research and assist in the drafting of the 2016 policy on children of the International Criminal Court, OTP, and um, Professor Zarugi kindly uh, accepted my request to meet with her at the UN headquarters in New York. We had a wonderful, very, very fruitful, warm, and generous visit that um, inspired that task forward, and I just wanted to remark upon that, and her, her anecdote now about working with the commander gives you an idea of just how important and effective she was as an SRSG in that role, so thank you. Um, child taking is defined in an article that finally has been published in the Michigan Journal of Law, Michigan Journal of International Law just last week. I'd be happy to send anyone a link if they would like it. Child taking is the label that I have given the criminal phenomenon which occurs when a state or similar powerful entity first takes a child and second endeavors to alter, erase, or remake the child's identity. The research began, not surprisingly, um, as a result of my thinking about uh, how to understand the removal of Ukrainian children by Russia and the developments in the ICC in commissions of inquiry, et cetera, surrounding that. It is clear that the allegations with regard to Russia fit within that. The children are being taken without their consent or the consent of their parents, and the allegations are that on arriving, they are, um, as we heard yesterday, being subjected to varying degrees of what's sometimes called indoctrination. I prefer identity alteration. Stripping of nationality. Um, I, I already mentioned LGBTQ. I can't imagine what it's like to have to be in Russia if that is your identity and you are a child at the moment. Um, language, military training, et cetera, et cetera, and indeed up to uh, adoptions of some of the children without ever uh, obtaining consent or notice of their parents. But it turns out, unfortunately, as I did re deeper research, that this phenomenon knows no borders and it knows no um, limits by time. It has occurred across centuries. Uh, we can look in the early 19th century there it was part of the Ottoman treatment of Armenians. Um, we can look to Latin America and the military juntas in Argentina, Chile, et cetera, um, on through, as I mentioned, uh, the perhaps one of the more longer lasting phenomena, which is the forced residential schooling of indigenous children. My focus has been North America but that occurred in almost every colonized nation to differing degrees. Um, and so I think it's important to think about it as something bigger before we begin to think about how to address it. Judge Ibanez Carranza yesterday mentioned the gaps in the law. There is no law 
on the books that deals with the phenomenon as I have theorized it. And the question is then, do we need to write something new? And my argument is no. My argument is we need to understand the wrong and then look and see what is available to do something about it. So yes, forced transfer of children as an act of genocide is also a form of child taking, but so are lots of other things. And um, there are many, many mechanisms, whether it's, it's criminal courts or commissions of inquiry, et cetera, where that can be addressed. I think in the next round of questions, I will talk about how to think about that in ongoing way forward um, outside of criminal prosecution, in part because as to that schooling phenomenon, it's very likely that all the perpetrators are dead. And so criminal prosecution is off the table, and that makes it imperative to think about other ways of reckoning with the injustice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Housel, I would like to return to you uh, with the wish that you educate us more on education in, uh, in the context of IHL, so to speak. Um, Mr. Rugi, already touched on the difficulties of securing protection uh, for children in relation to armed forces. Uh, and indeed, we all know that international humanitarian law needs to be re uh, respected by state and non-state non groups in order to be effective. And in the context of education, where do you see potential in that regard? Thank you very much for, for the question. First, I, I just want to come back to what was said about the term uh, indoctrination, because I think I very much agree with you that actually maybe it's not quite the right term, uh, and you, you use al alteration of identity. Um, there's been a, a report, and I saw also Dr. Bussell uh, here, who also contributed to a um, along with me to a report to the Council of Europe that was on cultural erasure. So yet another term, but that's also perhaps along the lines of what you're talking about that I think goes beyond uh, indoctrination really. So uh, thank you for, for that, um, that point. Uh, yeah, with regard to uh, armed groups, um, I did want to mention it because we're talking about um, children in armed conflict and uh, there hasn't been much discussion of armed groups so far. Um, and I think there's been quite a shift in the discussion. I mean, of course, when uh, you had um, ISIS and everything that was happening um, in, in Syria and uh, in that region. There was a lot of focus on armed groups, and now I guess with the, the full-scale invasion of Russia, the, the shift has somehow gone back to, a, to state obligation, but of course armed groups uh, also have obligation um, that they need to respect um, during armed conflict with regard to IHL, um, possibly also um, um, human rights uh, law. Um, and this, I think a lot of the mention that has been made during these two days with regard to armed groups were of them as, of course, perpetrators of violation as a, as a defendant uh, before the courts. Um, but um, it's important that uh, with regard to armed groups, uh, you consider two, two different groups. There's, of course, those who will disregard IHL no matter what, and you can't engage with them. And then you have other groups that you actually can engage with because they may be fighting an authoritarian regime, they are looking for legitimacy, they may become um, a state or an independent region in the future, so they really have an interest in, uh, in, respecting, um, in respecting IHL. Um, so I'll perhaps just uh, highlight, because uh, some of the work I had done on protection of education was with Geneva Cole, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar uh, with them and the work they've done on, on seeking to engage with armed groups. They have deeds of commitment uh, where they invite armed groups to come and, and um, abide, uh, sign a document, an official document, that they will abide by the rules. So it doesn't, uh, of course, um, change their status in any way, and they are bound by the rules already, but it's for for them to show that they are committed to abide by the rules, so kind of making it uh, somewhat more official, and that's uh, one way to go about it. They have one of their deeds of commitment is specifically on children in armed conflict, and it's actually the, the out of all of the deeds of commitment that they have, it's the, the second best, uh, I can't say ratified, but signed by, by the groups. 31 groups have signed it in nine different uh, countries. Um, but of course, there's an issue of, uh, of training, 
uh, and funding. Uh, quite often it's quite uh, difficult. It's seen as providing cap uh, capacity to the group. So there's of course a reluctance of state and intergovernmental organization naturally to, uh, to support that kind of work, but really it's a capacity to abide and to know the rules. Uh, and I think that there is uh, often quite a lot of interest. When I did the, um, some of these pilot trainings, uh, we asked them if they would like this training to be expanded, to be repeated, uh, to be rolled out to, to different groups. Uh, and they all said yes, uh, but then there was no funding uh, to do that. So I think uh, if we're also serious about the protection of children in armed conflict, we need to try to engage with the armed groups that are ready to engage and that are willing to, to learn about those rules. And just to, to perhaps point out, because we're talking about armed conflict, but really how many are there in the world right now? So I did look at the ICRC and some of their latest uh, numbers, and they said that they, uh, according to them, there are 120 armed conflicts in the world, um, and that uh, about 100 of uh, them are non-international armed conflict. And that's three times more than uh, 25 years ago. In 2000, they said there were about 30, and now they count uh, about 100 uh, of them. So something really, I think, to uh, consider. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, to take, again, a, very, a bit of a different angle, um, Betty, my, uh, from my modest perspective, um, I sometimes feel that in this world of international law and international policy, we over-internationalize things. Whatever problem occurs, we, we try to look for international solutions that can also be quite costly, if we are, if we are honest. Um, given your experience with regional and domestic mechanisms, in your view, how do you see this relation regarding the children of armed conflict can be done, can be more done or more effectively something done at the regional or domestic level? Well, um, your observation about internationalizing every problem is correct. Um, uh, in a sense, I, I, I think it's important that we have these international frameworks because they do provide um, um, a, a really good foundation for also the regional and national mechanisms uh, and frameworks to build on. And we heard um, two days ago from, or yesterday actually from Ambassador Atalia on the Africa Union uh, policies that have just been introduced. Um, the Africa Union is, does really well in articulating, uh, you know, uh, regional frameworks and policies. Uh, and and the, recent, the recent ones on child protection um, in peace support operations, I think, has very clear objectives. I, I won't repeat what was said yesterday. And then the other policy on mainstreaming child protection in African peace security architecture is really just uh, providing guidelines for uh, member states uh, on how uh, they are to um, implement their child protection policies. But on the ground, the domestic national legislation, I think is what needs strengthening. And there has been uh, quite a lot of progress in um, elaborating new anti-trafficking laws, for example, because we have found with, um, and this has been reported uh, by um, a majority of states in response, for example, to the COVID pandemic and to um, climate crisis, uh, that, that, that happened across the continent in Mozambique. There were cyclones, there was flooding in South Sudan uh, and other places. There was drought uh, in some parts of Southern Africa and uh, the, the Sahel. Uh, and so you find that during times like those, there's a lot of trafficking. And a, a lot of that trafficking involves uh, trafficking of girls, of, uh, of young girls. Some have trafficked for sexual uh, slavery and so on. And so there's been a lot of new laws that are being uh, introduced that address uh, this particular question of, uh, of trafficking. I would just like to say that, you know, when we talk about access to justice, and uh, Christine has talked about access to justice, we heard a lot about access to justice yesterday, access to international courts and tribunals, and to formal justice mechanisms. 
Um, that is a little bit of a mirage when you look at some of the contexts that we are really operating in. That I, I don't think there has been an update on the 2016 or 2019 uh, justice report that found, and this is a fact, I'll tell you that this is a fact, because we have plural justice systems in many of our countries, uh, access to formal justice mechanisms is at best 10 to 15 percent. The rest of the mechanisms that are available, even to children in armed conflict or to uh, communities in armed conflict, are uh, informal justice mechanisms. So, so what we are thinking in, in this community of actors that uh, is involved in transitional justice and so on, is that we need to strengthen those mechanisms that are available to the vast majority of the population. And those would be the non-formal justice mechanisms. It would be uh, around doing work to shift or to change the social norms the social, cultural, and gender norms that exist in those societies at all times, pre-conflict, during conflict, and post-conflict, that would enable responses to, be, to make sense within the system that is not the formal justice system. So there's a whole lot of uh, consideration that is beyond the conversations we have in international justice spaces where this change needs to, um, uh, to, to happen. So the, the question of shifting, changing the social, cultural, gender norms across the continuum of violence then becomes important because the problem doesn't arise when you already have children affected by armed conflict. They've been affected by the conflict, as was said yesterday and the day before, throughout the continuum. Um, part of um, you know, articulating these frameworks and laws is to ensure that you provide services to these children uh, in armed conflict or across the continuum of conflict. Uh, and, and, and part of this also means um, Having, uh, uh, like for example, we talk a lot about mental health support, psychosocial support, um, intergenerational trauma. I mean, it's dealt with differently in different communities. Uh, and I think, you know, acknowledging that this is, uh, uh, you know, what needs to happen is important. Um, health services, who is providing those health services, for example? What are the laws that enable you to ensure that uh, you are being able to provide health services to children affected by conflict who live in uh, areas that are not accessible. You know, so, so the problems are major uh, and diverse. I don't think there's a one, um, uh, one fits all kind of uh, response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. So my last question from, from the questions that I've prepared before I, uh, I've prepared before we move on to the uh, audience Q&A, uh, uh, Mr. Rugi. Yesterday, Professor Skelton was pointing out that the mandate of the Committee of the Right of Child is partly too limited. Um, based on your experience as special representative for children and, and armed conflict, uh, could an expansion of mandates, both mandates potentially, um, lead to a greater protection of children in armed conflict? By example, for example, adding further monitoring competencies or, yeah. Of course, there is no doubt that uh, these two uh, mechanisms, the uh, treaty body dealing with children and particularly that we have now the, um, the uh, uh, optional protocol on children armed conflict, ratified by, uh, when I saw I was I was uh, positively surprised because you have only 17 that just signed and seven that did not yet, uh, uh, not, not, neither signed, neither ratified. But the, the overwhelming majority, uh, 159, they are already, they already ratified. So that's something important. And when something comes from uh, the, the, the treaty body, uh, this will help 
and give the legitimacy. And I think person, the same with the, with the mandate of the SRG, and I will um, explain both how I see their uh, contribution. I think that even though the overwhelming majority ratified this treaty, you have to check what is happening on the ground. And I think, as I mentioned, it's extremely important to implement in the law, not only, in, uh, but to make sure that, and to do that, it's important to have sometimes field visit. Because when I, I was in DRC, uh, I was not, for example, uh, I discover that they don't have, uh, they, they ratified the, 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 the convention, but they, don't have, they did not criminalize the recruitment and use of children, so you have to do it. And then they don't have a, a tribunal all over the, uh, where, we, where they are needed. So I asked them to uh, 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 expand the territorial jurisdiction of the tribunal to the whole province and then we will provide the mobile code. That's how we did to make sure that to, to allow victim, because at the time it was to allow the victim and the witnesses to come to the court, otherwise the, the accused can escape because they are far away and they cannot come by their own means. Uh, so that's how we can and provide the lawyer for the victim and the lawyer for the accused to, preserve, to protect the right, the, the right to fair trial. All these things, I think the uh, treaty body, when you work with the, to uh, uh, examine a, a country situation or when you have the opportunity through uh, communication, is also to provide this kind of pragmatic solution and not besides what you give at the, the legal framework, but it's important to have this pragmatic solution to help a government because sometimes they don't know and sometimes they don't have the means so they forget about it because I cannot implement it. That's for uh, the treaty body and I think uh, uh, personally uh, their tools are extremely important because you, when you speak with the government, you say, you endorse, you accept. It's not, I am bringing something uh, that you already not accept. The second thing is the role of the, the um, uh, SRG on children in conflict. This is more political, give you the space. It's Security Council, and then you can, through the Security Council, uh, get this kind of support, pressure. They come visit on the ground and for, you organize the visit, you allow for the kind of question that they have to raise with the president, etc., and help things to move to the right direction. And for, the most important is also to know how to seize the opportunity to advance the protection. Now, for example, we are in a situation, and that's why I think the treaty body have to play an important role because we are seeing squeezing the space for uh, uh, the peacekeeping mission. They are almost closing. They left Sudan without any transition. In Congo, they are only present in two provinces. I used to be present in 16 provinces, everywhere in Congo. So that's a challenge that they will face. They will not have enough resources. To, so for me, it's extremely important to keep the child protection on the ground. You cannot uh, uh, rely only on the country team, not because they don't want, but sometimes they don't have the space, the political space. So human rights, child protection, uh, 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 if, uh, the, the gender staff, etc., they need to, to be preserved, at least for a transition, to prepare for uh, uh, someone else to take care of. That's extremely important, and I would really uh, uh, call on member states, and I will ask you to do so, is to ensure that there is a transition and we keep this tool on the ground at least for a certain time. It's important. This, the last, and I, will, I know that I'm taking abusing, but the last thing 
is also to use, because I uh, deliver, because thanks to UNICEF, thanks to NGOs like Save the Children, thanks to ICRC, thanks, these are uh, uh, also uh, partners that you have to use. And also the regional organization, African Union. Sometimes one country I, uh, can help you because they have the space in, in this place and you can rely on and you can work with and you can open the space. So it's very important that when you uh, try to advance the implementation of what is adopted at the international level is to give uh, uh, the, the right wording and the space to people on the ground to help you uh, to advance the implementation. And we need it more and more in the future. Thank you very, very much. That was indeed, again, very inspiring and insightful. And now we have to, we have to, uh, I'm moving to, to the uh, Q&A and I'm starting with an online question that, uh, yeah, I'm happy that it, fits with a backup question I, have, I had prepared. Um, and it, it, it relates to, to, to the point Professor Ayman already touched upon um, on, the, on the question of accountability. Um, because sometimes when in the international justice discourse, so to speak, I feel there's sometimes a, an ICC centricism or a, uh, international, account uh, international criminal accountability centrism. Um, what alternative justice mechanisms to protect the uh, children in armed conflicts do you think could be could be helpful and useful, and why? And if you you're very, uh, we were also happy if you connected with child taking again. Yeah? Thank you. I had been remiss in answering part of Angar's last question, which is how does child taking relate to Nuremberg? As I mentioned in a an, uh, question and answer intervention yesterday, uh, there was among the 12 subsequent proceedings here at Nuremberg, a trial known as RUSHA. RUSHA is the acronym for the German SS agency, uh, which translates as Race and Settlement Office. And within the SS was an agency called Lebensborn, which was the foster placement and adoption agency of the Nazi SS. The trial of 16 individuals that was held in this building um, charged, among other things, what then was called the war crime and crime against humanity of child kidnapping. And so much of the evidence included uh, documentation of the taking of many, many children from Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other places, and schooling them in schools where they were beaten if they spoke their native language, where they were politely given Hitler Youth uh, uniforms, taught the anthems, made to um, salute, and where indeed even their names were changed. The younger ones did not know their birth languages at the end of the war. Um, many of them never returned, particularly if they were very young, there was no way for them to be traced <laughs> after the war. Four of the 16 defendants were top officials of Lebensborn. One of them was a woman. Um, all four were acquitted because the court found that it was a benevolent charity. I think that that's a signal of the care or or, or caution that we should take before we prosecute um, things that are thought to be horrible. Uh, if I have an article that goes into why I think the acquittal happened, but anyone who works in international criminal law can kind of imagine how that might be. Therefore, even if we have live perpetrators, we should be thinking always about what brings the most redress, what enforces prevention. Thank you, Professor DeGreif. For me, this is the most important thing. We shouldn't have to worry about wrongs because they shouldn't occur to begin with. And what brings genuine reckoning and redress, both for the affected community and for the community that is seen as the perpetrator. What if you're the grandchild of someone who was involved in Jim Crow oppression? That can be very, very hard, I know, from my students to process. 
and our transitional justice mechanisms always should take into account how we're helping the entire society understand and get forward past histories. Remarkably, the United States Department of Interior has undertaken a three-year process, which just concluded in July, of uncovering the histories of forced indigenous schooling in the United States and documenting it in two reports that are over 200 pages long, plus 18 appendices. Among other things, they identify by name 18,000 children who were in the schools. There were many, many more, but they've spoken the names of 18,000 children. They've spoken the names of over 400 schools. And they have um, made recommendations there. The, the reports all have photos in them, so you have graphic as well as content, uh, li literal content. The process, and I think this is perhaps the most important thing, and I'm going to stop so my other colleagues can talk. The process occurred hand in glove with the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, which includes um, survivors of those schools who are now in their 70s, and um, includes a 12-stop healing tour to places where Native communities were so other survivors could give their testimonies. That seems to me to be the kind of thing which was done in Canada and Australia and New Zealand in different ways and many, many other countries for other issues that we perhaps should invest more energy into than we have. A national and local community-based process that may resonate more with the society most of concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to move to a um, question that comes from the in-presence audience, if there is anyone interested in, and yeah, Professor Skelton. Thank you very much to all the members of the panel for such a great, uh, great panel. You can't hear me? Other one? Is this one better? Good. Um, thanks to all the panelists for a really wonderfully uh, insightful discussion. Um, my question is for Leila Zarugi, and it's about the fact that the, um, not all the six grave violations trigger a listing in the annexures. And of course, it's a listing in the annexure of the Secretary General's report that leads to a plan of action, which is a direct engagement which can uh, both provide redress and perhaps uh, also help with prevention. So what I, what I understand is that at the moment, um, the denial of humanitarian assistance does not trigger a listing on the annexure. Isn't it time that that should be rethought? And who does that rethinking and how do we make that happen? Thank you, uh, Anne, for uh, raising this issue because I think uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, I was expecting after I left that the, late, the last uh, violation will be also added as a trigger for listing. But uh, when we know the history, it's important to know then to see how we can advance. Uh, uh, the mandate was created by the General Assembly and thanks to Olara Otunu, who was in the Security Council ambassador of his country, that he decided to bring this mandate to give the teeth to the Security Council and he managed to get that and identify the sixth violation. And just one year later, we have the first trigger for this thing, uh, recruitment and use. And then we stayed with the recruitment and use until 2009. In 2009, we get two triggers for this thing at the same time. And people don't know why. It was sexual violence. The P3 were pushing for the sexual violence. And the Russian decided to put uh, uh, the uh, killing and maiming because of what is happening in Iraq and in other places. To, uh, and then both of them decided to accept the two. So we get 
to trigger Philistine in one resolution 2009 because we have this tension between the, the P5. 2011, of the, I worked on the two, to the 2009-2011 because I was in Congo. And the sexual violence was at the time the mass rape and the visit of the Security Council. We pushed them to add a trigger for listing. That's how it happened. And in 2011, it could, attacks on schools and hospitals, and the Germans were uh, in the Security Council leading the working group, and they decided themselves also to have uh, 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 this uh, mark of Germany adding a trigger for this thing. So we added uh, 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 attacks on schools and hospitals in 2011. And when I was SRG, I pushed for abduction because we have a lot of abduction at the time, so we used it with, uh, to, uh, and it went uh, easily. Now, denial of humanitarian access is the most important and it's the opportunity with all what is happening now to push for adding it. But the problem is that always the resistance and because what is happening in Ukraine, what is happening in the, in the Middle East, certainly you will have resistance. But it's very important that you add this trigger for this thing because it helps to put pressure on government. Government don't want to be on this list they call list of shame. So I think uh, uh, we have to see, and I, I do ot my utmost best, if uh, uh, you can uh, coordinate with, the, with, the, with the, 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 the mandate, but also to identify the friendly country that will maybe help this to happen, because it's unfair that this, this, this uh, trigger stay outside, like you can uh, uh, deny the access to uh, humanitarian access to, to children. Thank you very much. Depending, we have five minutes left. Depending on the length of the question and the length of the response, uh, that should be sufficient. Uh, I see an interest uh, question. You, you, you okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think, we'll, let's, let's see. Please. Thank you. Um, first of all, a huge thanks to this incredibly impressive panel that we have before us. My question is also to Professor Zarugi. Um, and it relates to the Children Armed Conflict mandate, and it's such a privilege to hear about your experiences as the special representative of the Secretary General on Children Armed Conflict. So in the spirit of the kind of theme of this panel as ways forward and protecting future generations, I'd love to hear from you how you envision the future of the mandate, the opportunities that there are for growth at a time when the mandate is becoming increasingly politicized, it's a mandate under attack, and yet the need for it is so humongous in that one in six of the world's children live within 50 kilometers of a conflict zone, we see that grave violations against children in conflict are at an all-time high. So how, my question is, where do we go from here? What are the opportunities for growth? And do you regard the future of the mandate with optimism or pessimism? I, I uh, with, all, with all what is going on, I still continue to be optimistic because there is no other option if we would like to ensure, to support and to provide some positive aspect to those who are in need. Uh, I think that the mandate uh, uh, used to be attacked in the past, so I think it's, this time the mandate is not under threat. It's not the mandate under threat. The, what is under threat is the task force on the ground and the monitoring because you are seeing many uh, mission, peacekeeping mission, political mission, either le uh, send home without any transition or closing or whatever. And there is no appetite to open new mission. And I know that we are trying to think how we can deal with this and I, I'm uh, discussing with uh, peacekeeping. So uh, that's the problem. The problem is not threat, on the mandate, it's more the, the teeth that we must 
to find option, and that's what I said through UNICEF, through uh, uh, even uh, uh, pushing for the funding in the budget. That must be a space where we have to work with the General Assembly, working to make sure that we have uh, this presence. For example, when we closed the, our presence in, in the Kasai, I managed to get one year for the budget of the mission to pay the human rights office there. Because I explained that we are in transitional justice there and they will provide the support. I hope I answer your question. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very, very sorry, uh, Professor Daniri. I don't think we'd have time sorry, for another question really because I've been because clearly signaled. Of, this is to the German government. Sorry, what? This is to the German government. Professor Amman just spoke about the United States accounting for crimes that happened many years ago. Almost some of them were going on uh, until the 30s or the 60s. <clears throat> we know scientifically that children of survivors of the Holocaust are not all near need treatment, but many do. They don't get reparations for that. Part of the reasons I came here was to bring that message, and I didn't want to leave without saying it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daniele. So I've been clearly signaled that the panel on the ways forward, that the way forward for the panel is its very end. And uh, so this is how I conclude and hand over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Kiran Menon. Mohan das Menon. <laughs>